Our first panelist is Johanna Wagstaff. Uh, Johanna is uh, the meteorologist and science reporter uh, at uh, CBC Vancouver and CBC News Network. Wagstaff's academic background in seismology, in earth science, that has led her to cover major earthquakes, wildfires, hurricanes, floods, and the Copenhagen, Paris, and Glasgow Climate Change Conferences. Uh, Johanna has hosted three award-winning CBC podcasts, including Fault Lines, 2050 Degrees of Change, and is the author of several children's science books. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Please welcome Johanna Wagstaff. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am coming to you from the beautiful and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I am thrilled to be chatting to so many, I'm guessing, fellow weather weenies, because meteorology is a topic that affects and fascinates so many people. And I'm also thrilled to be chatting with uh, fellow panelists and Nadine, who I have immense respect for. Uh, as you'll find out through our talks, it's such an amazing community when it comes to meteorologists across the country. I wanted to start you off with a little video though. Uh, not quite archival footage from when I first began, uh, but it's close. Take a look at uh, one of the first TV forecasts uh, from CBC. This is Percy Saltzman, meteorologist in the uh, 1960s. Oh, hang on. Let me just play that. It hasn't been a delightful day anywhere. And the reason is the map is lousy with lows. Now, yesterday there was one here and one here. They've converged and in effect, the larger swallowed the smaller. And there's the low at the moment. And this is the frontal setup as a result of the low with the cooler air coming in this way, the warmer this way. And of course, the so what Percy is doing right now for a TV audience, is tremendous. using chalk and a chalkboard, of of Ontario, good part of Quebec, we don't quite use today. American states. That leaves the high pressure here out in the east, governing the weather there and producing clear and But I love that he's using east, science the to communicate the weather, which is what we still use today. Here, so I'm just going to mute this, but let this continue to play in the background. Because, you know, this many decades later, the science of weather forecasting really hasn't changed that much. You know, Percy is showing you the location of our pressure systems and our fronts, and he's moving them forward through time to give you his best estimate of the forecast for the country. That is an excessive low that he is circling right now across the prairies. Uh, and I just love that with all of our advancements in technology, the basics of weather forecasting really hasn't changed that much. So I know many of you are probably well versed in this, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a 101 on short range uh, weather forecasting. Um, I have always loved weather and science and the processes of the earth. Um, it was actually through getting my pilot's license that I became really interested in forecasting because as part of uh, the process to get your pilot's license, you have to learn how to do a bit of basic forecasting by reading the clouds, uh, doing a little bit of analysis ahead of time. And for me, that was just so amazing that as an individual, you could, you could do a mini weather forecast on your own every day using available tools to come up with a hypothesis. And that's what hooked me. So I just wanna show you a little bit about the basics of weather forecasting. Again, that hasn't changed that much in uh, you know the uh, the decades since Percy Salzman first started. So the basis of all weather forecasting, short range weather forecasting, comes down to measuring the weather right now on the ground. That is what we call our current or initial observations. And we use a variety of tools to get the current weather for different points all around the world. We use, of course, uh, the weather station. We have official and non-official weather stations that take all of the basic measurements of the atmosphere, temperature, humidity, wind speed and direction, pressure and precipitation. And these are fed into a network that meteorologists can access. And this is probably the most common tool for current observations. We also use weather balloons that help us figure out what the current observations of weather is at different altitudes uh, in the sky. And these are released twice a day around the world. Uh, I think we have over 30 of them here in Canada. We also use observations from uh, weather buoys that, again, take those initial conditions from the ocean. I really rely on that out in British Columbia. We use satellite data to get a picture of what's happening right now from space. 
And our initial conditions are expanding every day, which is making our forecast better and better. We're using data from airplanes as they take off and land. They're feeding back those initial conditions for us. And more and more creative ways to get those initial conditions are uh, advancing our accuracy every day. One of the ones that a lot of people are talking about is using uh, conditions from people's smartphones, because the better network we have of initial conditions, the better our forecast will be. Number two is entering all of these initial conditions into weather models, which is basically the equations that we know about how our atmosphere works. Uh, so plugging all those conditions into basically a supercomputer that run those equations about how the atmosphere moves over time. And then it comes down to interpretation. But I just want to show you these two graphics for a moment, because one thing that is changing uh, that I'm happy to deep dive into uh, later on is uh, the difference between deterministic and ensemble forecasting. And I like to think of it for any Marvel fans like metaverse. So the way that so many meteorologists have forecasted for so long is deterministic, which is sort of a, a snapshot on the left that's taking all those initial conditions, which don't cover the entire globe. So we have to interpolate uh, and, and make estimates about initial conditions in places that we don't have data. And then we end up with one picture of what the atmosphere looks in, in the future. This is a picture of North America. It's showing you uh, where the precip and uh, pressure systems will be in the future. Uh, on the right is uh, an example of an ensemble forecast. And this is becoming more and more popular and it's making our mid to long range forecast. So anything past three to 10 days more accurate. And you might've heard or seen these as spaghetti plots. So it basically takes those initial conditions and just alters them slightly. So you end up with solutions that are slightly different, but we do this hundreds and hundreds of times. So you can see on the right there uh, that we get an array of different answers and we're able to take the average of those, which is much more accurate. And I like to think of that as all of the different possible multiverses is available to us. So that's really how forecasting has changed significantly in the past few years. Our supercomputers are getting better and we're getting uh, better at those initial conditions. But interpretation is still key. We need people to take all of that data because there is so much data. And this is where uh, my love for forecasting really comes in is deciding what data you want to use in the time frame that you have for the forecast you have. And I know all of us panelists probably make different decisions based on our audience, based on the location that we're forecasting for, based on whether we're forecasting an, you know, a, a weekend forecast versus severe weather versus long, long range climatological data is we will interpret that differently. And, and that's why humans are so important behind the forecast. Uh, but before I wrap up, my, myself as a meteorologist, the industry has changed immensely in the 15 years that I've been forecasting. You know, when I first started there on the left, and maybe some of you recognize some of those Toronto meteorologists there, there's uh, Anthony Fresnel. It was a one-way conversation. We spent the whole day forecasting for the six o'clock news broadcast meteorologist. And now this two-way conversation we have where we're able to get instant feedback, instant forecast verification, and the negative side of social media has really changed my job. I'm forecasting uh, you know, 24 seven in some cases. But what I love about uh, meteorologists is that sense of community. And even though all of us panelists, you know, are in competition with each other in some ways, when severe weather or life-changing weather is on the table, um, we come together uh, to share the same message. And I just wanna end on that note that climate change is changing the role of meteorologists. And I think for many uh, broadcast meteorologists, we are the one interface that, that the audience has with scientists. And I, I do think for myself, it's part of my job to help communicate climate change because weather is how people will and are experiencing climate change. And in my 15 years, especially out here in British Columbia, you know, we've had back to back to back extreme weather events just in the past 10 months that have devastated our communities. And, uh, you know, I, the concept of climate and eco anxiety is real. And uh, it, it's going to continue to be a challenge, but one that uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can continue to step up to and work with my fellow colleagues on that communication. So thank you very much and looking forward to your questions.